Good morning, everybody. My name is Matt Hank. I'm the president of the Philadelphia Lawyers Chapter. I want to welcome you all this morning to our Third Circuit Conference. Thank you for coming. It's my honor to introduce to you our first panel this morning. To my immediate left is seated Judge Paul Mady. Judge Mady graduated from the University of Scranton in 1993. He then went to Seton Hall Law School, from which he graduated in 2001. Uh, highlights of his career since then are a pair of clerkships. He clerked on the District of New Jersey for Judge Leland and on the Third Circuit for Judge Cowan. Since then, he's been in a AUSA. He's been the Deputy Chief Counsel to the Governor of New Jersey, General Counsel to University Hospital, and he now, as you, most of you probably know, has a, a job on the Third Circuit where he's a judge. So he will be our moderator this morning, and it's my pleasure to introduce him. To his immediate left is Professor Emily Bremer of the University of Notre Dame Law School. Professor Bremer, Bremer graduated from NYU, both undergrad and law school. Since then, she has clerked for Judge Kleinfeld on the Ninth Circuit and has had academic jobs, including the one she currently holds uh, at the University of Notre Dame. To her immediate left is Adam White, a professor at George Mason University. Adam graduated from the University of Iowa undergrad. He went to Harvard Law School, and he clerked for Judge Santel at various points in his career before ascending to the professor professorship he holds now. And then finally, to Adam's left is Professor David Zaring of the University of Pennsylvania Law School. Professor Zaring graduated from Swarthmore undergrad before going to Harvard for law school. Uh, before becoming a professor at Penn, he served in the United, as an attorney in the United States Department of Justice, and he was professor at Washington and Lee for a time before that. So once again, it's my pleasure to welcome our distinguished panel, and I turn matters over to Judge Mady. Matthew, on behalf of the panel, thank you for that kind introduction. I'm so delighted to join so many old friends and many new leaders at this event. And it's a thrill to start this extraordinary conference off with a discussion on perhaps the least interesting topic. I hear some laughter, so let me explain. In his famous 1986 speech on the doctrine of original meeting, Justice Scalia noted his fondness for teaching against the class, taking positions that students were almost certain to disagree with in order to generate some discussion. He used a similar contrarian approach in public talks, explaining, quote, it is neither any fun nor any use preaching to the choir. Well, on the matter of public talks, like any other matter, I know following the great justice's example is sure to keep me on the right path. So I'll honor his practice by imagining him here today, informing this perhaps skeptical audience that in the long run, Chevron will endure and be given its full scope because it more accurately reflects the reality of government and thus more adequately serves its needs. But we need not imagine. Those were the words the justice himself spoke in 1989, defending deference to executive interpretations, acknowledging that, quote, on its face, that success, that suggestion seems quite incompatible with Marshall's famous charge that it is emphatically the province and duty of the judicial department to say what the law is. Prophetic words, it would turn out, as Chevron indeed lives. And it doesn't live alone. For more than 20 years, federal courts have deferred to an agency's interpretation of its own regulations as controlling unless plainly erroneous or inconsistent with the regulation. Now, the critics of Auer versus Robinson, as you may have heard, are legion. Some argue that judicial deference to administrative agencies tramples the Article III interpretive power. Others denounce it as inconsistent with the Administrative Procedures Act. Many more bemoan that it incentivizes agencies to intentionally write ambiguous rules and then do what they please. A steady drumbeat seemed poised to reach crescendo last term. And then it didn't. <laughs> Kaiser versus Wilkie upheld our deference courtesy of a multi-part test, requiring first courts to first determine if a regulation is 
genuinely ambiguous using all the traditional tools of statutory interpretation, a result that Justice Gorsuch characterized as seeming to reduce our to the role of a tin god, officious but ultimately powerless. Yet, even those prodigal children have a habit of returning <coughs> home. So, have the offspring of Seminole Rock now been exiled, or does the principle of deference that Justice Scalia once championed still stand as head of the House? We are fortunate to have this morning's panel to discuss. We'll start with Professor Bremer before hearing from Adam and David, and after what I'm sure will be a lively exchange, we'll end with some audience questions. Professor, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Judge. Uh, and thank you to all of you for uh, being here on this fine fall morning uh, to discuss what I believe is actually a very interesting subject, although I find myself frequently in the minority. I also teach civil procedure. I tell my students routinely that they can always take comfort in the fact that at least one of us is enjoying this. Um, so, uh, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through a few points that, and in, in, in many respects, I think uh, you're going to find my remarks to be perhaps not going quite as far as uh, the judge's uh, suggestions, but, but fairly close to it. And I'll begin with uh, the point that uh, in, in Kaiser, the, you know, the court had the opportunity to overrule our. This is a very rare instance in which a case soundly raises the question of overruling a major precedent of the court. Um, and it declined to do so, uh, but it, the, the majority uh, opinion, or, or at least Justin Kagan's opinion for the, for the court, did so with a, a narrowing restatement of the doctrine. And that, that, that little tiny bit of that word, re, is really a theme of the opinion. Um, and just to take a, a few quotes that sort of Justice Kagan really emphasizes the re-narrowing or the reinforcing of the doctrine. Even as we uphold it, we reinforce its limits. The deference doctrine we describe is potent in its place but cabined in its scope. We take the opportunity to restate and somewhat expand on those principles here to clear up some mixed messages we have sent. We think it is worth reinforcing some of the limits inherent in the our doctrine. And that's really the theme of the opinion. They don't overrule our they redefine it in a way that uh, really presents a much more narrow version of its possible former self. Um, and you can question, I think, how much that is a, a sort of genuineness, that how genuine it is that they really have retained uh, the Our Doctrine rather than presenting a new doctrine that is, uh, is really just significantly uh, more cabined than it was before. Um, and as, as Justice Gorsuch puts it, he says, yeah, you've retained the doctrine, but it's zombified. Um, and Ro I think it's also notable that Justices Roberts and Kavanaugh, and Kavanaugh's joined by Alito, wrote separately to say that they don't view there as being much difference between the majority and the dissent. Um, and that, I think, is, is also a, a pretty striking uh, indication of what's actually going on in the opinion. Now, the second point I'd like to make is I, I think that Kaiser really is a sign of what is likely to come. There's been a, a resurgence in what uh, Professor Jillian Metzger at Columbia has described as anti-administrativist uh, resurgence against the administrative state. But I think it's likely to come to a similar end to how, what our has come to in Kaiser, which is not as a seismic change, a rejection of existing doctrines, but rather a more thoughtful uh, construction of those doctrines that results in a more, more narrow and precisely drawn uh, rule of, of law. Um, and so, I, you know, I think we're likely to see Chevron coming to the court as well. And although several of the justices say, you know, what we say in, in Kaiser says nothing about the issues in Chevron, I think it's likely that the judicial response there will be similar to what you see in Kaiser, which is not a rejection of Chevron and, in fact, a formal retaining of the opinion, but in, the, in a more narrowed um, formulation. Now, the third point I'd make is how much the things really change, I think, is, is less a matter of what the court says and rather more of what happens in practice as the newly redefined doctrines are worked out in practice by agencies, by district courts, by appellate judges. Um, and, and here I'm inclined still to think that we're unlikely to see much of a seismic shift um, because of the fundamental point that there is sort of inside these doctrines a very valuable, almost magnetic kind of common sense principle 
in the administration of government that's, that's unlikely to be rejected. You might think of it as the grain of sand inside the pearl, and the question that we're facing right now is how much of the pearl will be removed once it's polished and shined. Uh, and, and at the end of the day, even Justice Gorsuch says, you know, in Skidmore, there's a very sort of common sense notion of giving due respect to the expertise of administrative officials who are charged by Congress with the first line decision in how to administer statutes. Uh, now, the, the final point that I'd say is, is that I think this is another reason, this, this notion of, of, of there being something very compelling at the heart of these doctrines, is a reason why I'm skeptical that a more aggressive, non-judicial approach to, uh, to, to changing them would be unsuccessful in practice. There have been some attempts in Congress to over, overturn Chevron, for example, um, by statute. And I think even if that were to be successful, the way it would work out in practice would be much like, uh, like a more narrowed version of Chevron that could come out of the courts. Um, and that's because of those, I think, fundamental realities of, of, uh, of there being a, a, a proper place for some uh, degree of respect to administrative decisions. Um, and, and I'll say also that I think Justice Gorsuch even in a way recognizes this when he points out the fact that the APA was trying to change uh, judicial deference doctrines and it failed. Uh, and I remain skeptical that a new statute would be likely to succeed where the APA itself has failed. Um, and so on that very uplifting note, I'll uh, turn it over to leave Adam. Good. Thank you. Um, I mean, it's true, as, as Scalia actually says at the outset of the article of the talk that the judge quoted at the outset, uh, administrative law has a tendency to be some pretty pretty dull stuff. He says at the outset, he says, oh, grab a hold of both sides of your chair, uh, you know, drink some coffee. Um, I, I usually drink coffee these myself so the speaker doesn't go to sleep. Um, but the thing is, it's easy to sort of get drowned, it's easy to, to get lost in the minutia of administrative law. It's always important to take a step back and think about the big picture, especially at a place like the Federalist Society. Um, twice in the Federalist, Alexander Hamilton says that the best test of a good constitution is its tendency to produce good administration. He says this in Federalist 68, and it's so important he doubles back to it and quotes himself, a very Hamiltonian thing, uh, at, at uh, he could have been a law professor. Um, he quotes himself in Federalist 76 and says the true test of, good, of a constitution is its tendency to produce good administration. And so we have to think hard about what that means. And the Federalist and the Framers, they often point out, and Madison here was the best, he said, the challenge in all of this is coming up with the right balance of energy and stability. He at one point refers to something he calls the genius of Republican liberty. And those two words together, Republican and liberty, having both the rule of law and a government that's accountable to the people. That's the challenge of constitutionalism, and it's the core challenge of administrative law. And it's the challenge that the justices and others have been grappling with, um, especially in the last few years, as Justice Thomas and others, Philip Hamburger, uh, began to raise fundamental questions about long-settled questions of administrative law. The Kaiser decision of, last, of the last term is a really fascinating window into where the justices are. It shows us how far, <coughs> we've, how far we've moved from where we were just a few years ago, but it also raises some interesting questions about where we're going next. And so I'm going to talk just very briefly about what we seem to be leaving behind, and I think in some ways it's a great loss, and then I'm going to point to where we might be headed, which I think is a great challenge. Right now, in the debates about administrative law and Kaiser deference and Chevron deference, we see basically a debate between the right and the left. The left arguing, this is very, very broad, so please forgive me, but the left, I think, erring on the side of, of um, deferring to technocratic expertise, technical expertise, and the right arguing more and more for greater judicial intervention and management into these issues. A debate between technical expertise and judicial power, which is another form of technical expertise. We're working our way towards sort of a war over which experts are better suited to manage administration, technocrats or judges. Something's missing in the middle here. And it's what Justice Scalia advocated for for almost his entire career and what he puts at the center of his Duke Law Journal article, which I think is actually the most eloquent and best defense that Chevron ever received. What are we leaving behind? I'll get to that in a second. As Emily pointed out in Kaiser, 
we saw some, and as the judge pointed out, we saw some reform of our deference, not as much reform as a lot of people hoped. I actually think we'll come to think of Kaiser as we often think of Chevron. The scholars like to call it an accidental landmark. Because Kaiser, did, I think for the reasons that Emily just pointed out, Kaiser did what Chevron did. It took a bunch of different strains of deference law, brought them together in a framework, and very subtly, but I think importantly and significantly, changed the framework that it purported to restate. And Emily walked through this. I think the key to it is that it emphasized particular aspects of deference doctrine, some aspects over others. It emphasized some factors and de-emphasized others. In the middle of the opinion, the court clicks through a list of considerations that are going to limit Chev uh, our deference. I'm going to focus on three in particular. One, uh, the first one is that our deference really only belongs to an agency's authoritative interpretation. Right? What's coming out of the head of the agency, the leadership of the agency, not from the lower levels of the bureaucracy. That's significant. Second, deference is owed to things that are what they call the fair and considered judgment of the agency. Not just a, an interpretation the agency just sort of throws out there into the world, but a judgment that is considered and fair. And by fair they meant, and they said, not disrupting settled expectations willy-nilly. Like being more deferential to interpretations um, that, that, that preserve stability in the law. And the third one that jumped out at me is when the court says, it will give deference to an interpretation that in some way implicates the agency's substantive expertise. Really putting substantive expertise <coughs> front and center. Those three factors together means that our deference is now going to prioritize stability, um, which by the way is going to give a first mover advantage to whatever agency first interprets a regulation. Um, second, it's going to prize techni technical or technocratic expertise. So what's lost in all of this? What's lost is the sort of democratic small d democratic administrative law that Scalia prioritized. Uh, an administrative law, including Chevron deference, that deferred not just to expertise, but also to the value judgments inherent in an agency's decisions. Scalia made that the core of his view of administrative law, um, especially on Chevron deference. He wanted elections to have consequences. He wanted to make sure that judges would no longer lock in their preferred policy judgments, as the DC Circuit did throughout the 1970s and 1980s. Scalia wanted to preserve space for policymakers to exercise policy judgment that isn't micromanaged by judges. Um, and so I think the more that we get away from this, uh, both in the debates between right and left and now in our deference, I think we need to recognize that we're losing something here. We're going to have an administrative law that is either more technocratic or more judicially managed, but in either case less democratic. So what might replace it? I'll just say in a, in a brief minute, what might we rediscover? Well, if we're going to look forward to the future, I hope, if we're leaving behind democratic administrative law, which I think is a loss, I think the next thing we should aim for, and this is also is rooted in the Federalist, is what Alexander Hamilton referred to as the steady administration of the laws. We all know his famous line in Federalist 70 about energy and the executive. He said, we need energy and the executive for, among other things, the steady administration of the laws. Administration that's energetic, but steady, but stable, predictable. Hamilton was very worried about wild swings in administration from one administration to the next, if only because it creates the kind of uncertainty and instability that's anathema to you know, a society that has you know, settled legal expectations they can, build, they can build their lives on. So in practice, this is difficult, I think, for judges to manage. But I think in practice, what it means is allowing more flexibility for interpret agency interpretations for new regulations, but over time, sort of allowing things to settle giving more deference to settled interpretations and looking skeptically upon radical dislocations from one administration to the next. I think this looks something like what Madison was getting at in Federalist 37 when he talked about the meaning of a law becoming liquidated and ascertained over time, right? Or the actual practice of administering a law allows us to best interpret that law. Um, again, this is a tough line for judges to apply, but I think they ought to think about it in those terms. And in a way, that's what Kaiser is doing. And so for me, that's the best version of Kaiser would be one that allows initial flexibility, but then sort of locks things in and requires agencies to go through more of a process uh, when they reinterpret the laws. I think that's a present not just in Kaiser. I think it's also a consideration in the commerce case, the citizenship case, where the court was a little less deferential to an agency practice or process they thought was erratic. And we might see a little bit of this coming up in the DACA reconsideration case as well. So I look forward to those as the next
sort of test of, of where the court might be headed. Great. Well, <clears throat> uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And um, what I thought I'd do is talk a little bit about um, uh, the parts of Kaiser that I think are new um, uh, and also talk about the sort of um, reasons why people have been worried about our deference um, and then suggest that uh, those reasons don't appear to be uh, placed in or, or appear to be somewhat misplaced when you look at the actual practice of courts and the frequency with which our deference is reviewed. And then uh, finally I want to talk about some of the alternatives to our and uh, what judges might do with it. Okay, so. Um, I get why people worry about our deference. Um, there's this sort of separation of powers concerns that deference to agency interpretations of their own regulations make the agency both the sort of legislator and the judge. Um, and uh, that looks bad, though that's something we've made our peace with in the administrative state since cases like Withrow versus Larkin. And secondly, I get the idea of agency abuse. It's intuitive and easy to understand, and uh, John Manning wrote a great article about it. Uh, and you could assume that agencies uh, under our deference might maximize their power by promulgating broad regulations open to a variety of interpretations, and therefore uh, taking the opportunity to choose their own sort of light touch judicial review by having the discretion to interpret their regulations as they see fit, uh, and have a lot of flexibility to interpret those regulations however they wish. Okay, so much so far makes sense. Um, so why didn't the court respond to these concerns in Kaiser versus Wilkie? Well, it's first of all worth noting that the case was extremely close. I've uh, seen it called a, not a 5-4, but a 4.6 to 4.4 decision uh, because Justice, uh, Chief Justice Roberts only joined the part of uh, the majority opinion that talked about the limitations when not to apply our deference and the importance of stare decisis, which is not exactly a full-throated endorsement of agency <laughs> technocratic expertise. And then secondly, I agree with Adam that this uh, unfair surprise um, uh, reason not to apply our um, could be something that courts make use of. Um, and I'm not sure which way it'll cut. It'll be sort of a conservative or even Burkean approach to administrative law that would make change in the current administrative law we have that much more difficult. And I'm not sure who exactly uh, would want that, but that's one of the implications of the Kaiser decision that goes beyond ordinary hour deference. Okay, so the thing that I don't understand about the worries about hour is why those worries that are intuitively understandable don't seem to appear in the actual practice of the federal courts. So for example, uh, after Manning's article, uh, uh, Cass Sunstein and Adrian Vermeule uh, wrote that they uh, couldn't believe that any agency had ever written a regulation uh, to be broad to maximize their own discretion. And indeed, there's a lot of reasons why agencies might want to be, write clear regulations so that regulated industry knows exactly how they're supposed to comply with what the agency wants to do. Second, um, uh, Dan Walters took a look at agency, you know, um, using a content analysis, so he ran it through the filter. Uh, how vague are these regulations? And he looked at agency regulations promulgated before hour uh, and agency regulations promulgated after hour, and he couldn't see a difference in the lack of clarity. So it's not clear that agencies are taking this opportunity that the Supreme Court has extended to them to write vague regulations. And finally, citations to hour and Seminole Rock uh, are dwarfed by citations to Chevron deference. Uh, it's dwarfed by citations to State Farm hard look review. Uh, and even to the Fox, Fox Broadcasting case that discussed uh, when agencies can change their policies, that gets uh, way out of sights, um, uh, our versus uh, Robbins, or in a, <laughs> uh, that's, uh, I forget who the defendant or the uh, uh, respondent was now, Robbins, I think. Um, so uh, that, uh, um, uh, so all of this means that it's not clear to me in practice that these um, you know, realistic and understandable concerns about our deference uh, are warranted, that agencies are taking this opportunity to run roughshod over any constraints uh, imposed by law to uh, promulgate regulations that are vague. Okay, um, so uh, the final things I wanted to talk about relatively briefly is you know, what could replace our uh, and I wanted to throw a sort of goofy suggestion out there and then a natural suggestion out there. Um, and then I wanted to speculate a little bit about how judges might um, uh, respond to Kaiser versus Wilkie. Okay, so um, 
What could you do other than defer to agency interpretations of their own regulations? Okay, well, one thing you could do is um, keep that deference, but impose some sort of like, uh, is there self-dealing by the agency here? Are they aggrandizing their own power or uh, shirking duties or uh, doing what their uh, political supervisors want? And I want to suggest to you that that would be a really problematic inquiry. Uh, it wouldn't be very predictable. We might want agencies to do what their political supervisors want them to do. Um, and uh, uh, you know, uh, assessing whether this regulation is an example of agency aggrandizement, this interpretation of an agency regulation is an example of aggrandizement, would be extremely hard to do. Okay, uh, another uh, possible solution to our is to not have courts defer to agency interpretations of their own regulation. That's a somewhat natural approach. But there too, I wonder, how would it work in practice? Uh, would the court read the agency interpretation of its own regulation? It would seem to me that it would have to do so. Um, uh, and in doing so, would begin the process of taking the agency's views about what it was trying to do into account. Uh, it's hard to me to imagine why a court would be able to ignore an agency interpretation of its own regulation or not consider it. Um, and whether we'd, we'd uh, suspect that the quality of judicial review would be improved by that kind of approach. And this is one of the reasons why I think, by the mere fact, and this I think is a, a support for Chevron deference as well, the mere fact that courts review what the agencies did uh, means that the agency's uh, importance in uh, you know, assessing whether that uh, was appropriate is going to be really hard to dislodge. And in general, uh, I'm on record as having this view that uh, it's really hard to titrate standards of review uh, in particular levels of deference, super deference, a little deference, uh, almost de novo uh, uh, review. Uh, and what really happens when courts are reviewing agency actions in the administrative law context is a sort of general reasonableness inquiry, which is, I think, difficult to get away from. But I have to admit, against interest, that uh, sometimes um, the Supreme Court expresses a mood and it seems like uh, judicial review varies after that happens. So it expressed a mood, as it said, in con uh, Congress and the Universal Camera versus NLRB case. And then I think judicial review of uh, agency substantive evidence findings and formal adjudication increased in, in severity. Uh, I think something similar happened in Vermont Yankee versus NRDC where the Supreme Court's browbeating of the DC Circuit led to more deferential judicial review for the next decade and a half at least. Um, and indeed, the Chevron case itself, as Adam suggested, um, the court, Supreme Court might not have realized that it was expressing a mood, weirdly enough. Uh, and that case got picked up uh, by the DC Circuit and they ran with it. So I guess the question here is, does Kaiser express a mood by going through uh, the very um, uh, various steps that a court should make sure uh, ha it has satisfied itself of being met before uh, exuding any deference to agency interpretations. Um, uh, that could, um, uh, you know, Kaiser end up being a sort of anti-administrative canonical case. Um, so it's uh, difficult to know whether that'll happen, but that is something that um, uh, uh, lower courts could do. Um, but uh, uh, while I keep that interpretation open as a possibility, my own view is it's more likely that what our means is that uh, the way agencies are gonna uh, courts are going to review agency interpretations of their own regulations is, uh, as our was reaffirmed, the same way they've been doing it in the past. <coughs> and I'm not sure whether the administrative state and its review is going to change much regardless. Thanks. So it's important for judges to speak with precision, and as most judges do, I have failed in that regard. Uh, my, my remarks at the beginning, quoting the justice that this was perhaps the least interesting subject, uh, were not in any way a slight on the relative uh, compelling nature of administrative law, but rather, here we stand 30 years later from his comments, having essentially the same conversation, and in, to, to my mind, reaching many of the same conclusions. So, and, and I'll open this up to anyone who would like to respond. What would, you know, what would from that original Duke vision uh, in 1986 of uh, the justice's conception of the proper balance of the administrative state uh, still remain after Kaiser? And, and what should we as uh, lower courts be looking to embrace both from his vision of how best to interpret these doctrines and what the court um, has determined we should do? Uh, 
a, a professor, uh, Ron Cass, he wrote a, an article recently, he was a friend of Scalia's, and he called it um, uh, Administrative Law in, in Scalia's Wake. Uh, I joked with him, he should have reversed it, it should be Scalia in Administrative Law's Wake. Because quite honestly, I think we're really leaving behind the most important things, uh, the things that were most important for Scalia, and not just the whole democratic point. Scalia wanted deference doctrines that were straightforward, simple. He loved Chevron with two steps, not three steps, not 19 steps, one step. He wanted to avoid totality of the circumstances tests. It's why he hated the pre-Chevron Skidmore deference uh, approach, and he hated all the extra little nuances and wrinkles that his colleagues added to Chevron. Um, until he, he sort of, he went from being pro-hour deference to on a dime being anti-deference. He didn't sort of pick a, a gray area in between, here's how we should calibrate it. So I think he would be very, very, he would have dissented in Kaiser. He would have said, no, it's not amended, don't end it. It needs to end. We need a bright line rule on deference, and the rule should be no hour deference. Um, and I think that the, 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 cor the course the court is now charting is going to get further and further away from the simplicity that Scalia wanted, for some good reasons, and I think for, for some um, difficult reasons. Yeah, I agree. It's a, you know, there's four or five things that courts are now supposed to do before they apply to our, before they turn to our deference. Um, and uh, you know, it's, I think it would be easy for a, an appellate court or a district court judge to say, um, you know, uh, we're not going to apply our deference because, you know, the, at some point on this uh, set of hurdles, um, the agency didn't get over one of the hurdles. Um, so that's how Kaiser versus Wilkie becomes substantive. Um, uh, you know, the way it doesn't is that um, uh, courts just keep citing our, or maybe they'll start calling it Kaiser deference. Uh, one of the interesting things that happened in the, you know, the citation of cases is. Um, Seminole Rock deference is very similar to our deference, uh, and uh, it was the case that was uh, the deference to agency regulation case until our was decided, um, and then our became that case. So citations to Seminole Rock dropped, uh, citations to our grew to some degree, and so maybe this will be the new our standard. Uh, but like I said, I, I think it's really hard to get away from uh, the old our standard. Let me just add on that real quick. I didn't mean to cut you off. No, no, I'm no, sorry. No. I think it's important to call it Kaiser deference because it is different than our deference. It's much different emphases. And also, Kaiser deference is just a great pun. And I think it sort of plays well. <laughs> I think it works well for people who are calling for reform. So I agree with that. The only thing I'll add is uh, it seems to me, and I've been thinking about this a lot in, in a variety of contexts in my work, that we are having the same conversation, but the conversation is being joined by a much broader swath of people. I mean, administrative law, I think, for a long time was that boring subject that most people avoided. Um, and just like Chevron was an accidental landmark, you can point to, I think, multiple cases in the administrative law canon that were major turning points in the way that courts interact with administrative agencies that were not well thought out at the time they were decided. And in fact, I mean, you look back at them and you can say they were wrong if you know anything about administrative law. And some of the explanation for that is that the justices of the Supreme Court themselves found administrative law boring and didn't really pay enough attention to what they were doing and why they were doing it. And so we may be having the same conversations, but now we have a, you know, a vast majority of the Supreme Court who are justices who have significant experience with administrative law. Administrative law is vastly bigger in scope, and there are just a lot more people who do it and know about it and talk about it, and it's a thing that actually makes headlines and that people are talking about. Um, and so even if we do end up in a similar position, which I think is largely but not entirely likely, uh, it's going to be a position that is arrived at with, I think, more careful, thoughtful, and broader consideration of the issues, and that, to my mind, is valuable in its own right. We spent a lot of time talking about judges and agencies. It occurs to me that there is a third branch of government that might develop into this conversation, and Emily, you noted that Kaiser sort of recognizes that the APA failed. Um, how, how can that be? How can it be that Congress's direction on what it is that both agencies and courts are supposed to do has not uh, proven successful? So I think part of, the, part of the explanation with respect to the judicial review provision, provisions of the APA is actually a political story. And the Attorney General's Committee um, on Administrative Law really tried to get a very deferential structure of judicial review enacted into the statute, and they lost that battle. Um, and the provisions that were actually enacted uh, 
you know, it basically embraced the sort of Crowell versus Benson formulation where courts would have de novo review on law and, uh, you know, there'd be a deferential review of fact finding. But immediately in the wake of, of the APA's adoption, the Attorney General uh, put together a manual on the Administrative Procedure Act that, in effect, uh, sort of reinterpreted those provisions of the APA to recapture what they had lost in the legislative battle. And that was a pretty successful move. I mean, a lot of agencies acted that way. A lot of courts have looked, including the Supreme Court in Kaiser, right, Justice Kagan cites the AP, the Attorney General's manual as sort of, um, and, and recognizes that the court has on, in, on multiple occasions recognized it as an interpretive tool for the APA, but it's not, it's a political document. So part of, part of the answer is what, you know, to why did the APA fail is because from the moment of its adoption, certain parts of it were, were targeted to fail. Um, and I've got thoughts about the failure of the adjudication provisions, which I'll, I'll spare you. You're welcome. Um, but I think it's not the only area of the APA that that um, that was targeted for failure and those efforts succeeded. I can, uh, oh, I'll say that um, in my view, uh, the APA wasn't a total failure from the perspective of, um, you know, George Shepard wrote that it was, it was really a, an initial effort to rein in the New Deal administrative state. Um, and the way I think it most successfully did that was through notice and comment rulemaking, because I think that um, gives regulated industry uh, an opportunity to um, participate in the rulemaking development process and an interest in doing so, which isn't always shared by uh, other potential stakeholders in administrative action. So notice and comment rulemaking, to me, and the institutionalization of that, uh, made a big difference for the people who uh, set up the APA as a way of taming um, some of the New Deal innovations. But um, I agree with Emily in uh, her broader point, which is that um, I'm not always sure that process-based efforts to constrain the bureaucracy are as successful as substantive efforts um, uh, uh, asking for, say, regulatory relief. Um, and so I study financial regulators most carefully. Um, and you know, when the when the Congress passed the Jobs Act and told um, and told the SEC to create some sort of you know glide path for emerging growth companies um, to go through the um, you know the registration process more easily and to talk uh, you know avoid some of the gun jumping rules that the devil. Um, companies that wanted to go public, it worked, and the SEC has increasingly adopted those rules more broadly. And um, you know that was a substantive decision: um, uh, uh, deregulate this area, or a substantive act by Congress. Um, and similarly, the you know 2017 statute, GRIPA or whatever uh, the acronym is, that um, told the Fed to lay off community and regional banks, um, has uh, resulted in regulations which have done exactly that. Um, but um, I'm, you know, I'm less confident. I mean, you can, I'm sure you could devise some process rule that would really, really ensure that deregulation happened. I'm just less confident of that things like the Reins Act will end up um, making as big a difference as the, their proponents hope. One other area for a potential reform, should it be desired, is of course the states themselves. Um, Utah, Michigan have taken positions contrary to that of Chevron, and I'm curious if anyone has seen innovative experiments at the state level, and if not, uh, what should reformers seek to seek to achieve in the state looking to address this area? Well, I'm glad you asked this because it's not a question that we ask enough uh, down in Washington or in the field of administrative law. Um, states have done a lot of important things. I mean, even Arizona, right, I took legislative action to do away with their version of Chevron deference. I think Arizona was also one of the states that helped do more on what they call regulatory sandboxes, which is, you know, zones, kind of what we were getting at with, with what David just talked about, these, these zones of regulation that are reformed significantly to leave space for innovative technologies. Uh, Brandeis famously called the states laboratories of democracy. That's a good metaphor. I also like laboratories of liberty uh, or also laboratories of administration. Uh, one of the initiatives that my program at George Mason is going to be focusing on a lot in the next year and a half is what we can learn from the states. Washington is very good at telling the states things. It's time, I think, that a lot of us listen and learn because so many reforms that are sort of brushed aside in Washington and in academic circles as implausible or impracticable are actually being tried and experimented with at the state level. And I think if there is going to be long-term reform, or if there isn't a long-term going to be reform, 
I think the states are going to have to continue to lead the way and let the rest of us sort of study this and advocate for reform based on what's worked at the state level. I think that's right, although I think uh, I, I'll reiterate a point that, that David just made, which is that process-based reforms, I think, are, are, are limited. And I'm a total proceduralist. I think procedure matters, um, and I'm geeky about it and very passionate about it, which I realize makes me a weirdo. Um, not here it does. Maybe not here it doesn't. But it actually really frustrates me that oftentimes what are really substantive debates about the scope of regulatory authority and um, are, are, are really, those battles are, are sort of taken to the procedural arena when they properly belong in a substantive place. Um, and if the concern is that federal regulation is, is too significant, then the answer is to pull back on some of those substantive delegations to agencies. And the ability to address those matters through procedure, I think, is extraordinarily limited. And we're spending a lot of time talking about procedure when maybe what we ought to be talking about is substance. But on the state point, I think it's a similar sort of answer, which is that the states, I think, are to a certain extent limited in what kind of reforms they can do and the extent to which they can be laboratories of administrative procedure uh, when the federal government uh, is sort of taking, has sort of taken over a lot of those areas of substantive regulation. Um, and so in order to make them I mean, if you want the states to be more effective laboratories of administrative procedure, you have to make them also more effective laboratories of substantive regulatory power. And so, in a certain extent, you can't think about just this horizontal separation of powers issue distinctly from the vertical separation of powers issue that, um, that arises with really the, dorm the, the Commerce Clause uh, jurisprudence. So if there's one takeaway from this so far, it's go read or reread Justice Scalia's uh, Duke article, because uh, I'd like to return to it again. Another point that he makes in the article is that one who more often finds that the meaning of a statute is apparent from its text, thereby finds less often that the triggering requirement for Chevron deference exists. Justice Kavanaugh makes essentially the same point. Is this in many ways the path Forward, that if judges apply traditional and ordinary tools of statutory interpretation, <coughs> much of this question of deference to the executive branch will wash away. I know Justice Kavanaugh, um, now Justice Kavanaugh believes that, uh, he, uh, this is so name droppy. he told me that when he was Judge Kavanaugh. <laughs> <laughs> um, so see, I know celebrities. Uh, um, <laughs> I needed to have a substantive point after that. <laughs> <laughs> can, can, I, can I jump Please, in? Yeah, yeah. So this, this article, you really should read it. I, I have the pleasure of, since I teach at the Scalia Law School, and his name is right there on my business card, I get to teach an entire semester-long seminar on Scalia. Last week, we actually read this article. Um, next week, we're reading essays he was writing on administration when he was a law professor and lowly think tank scholar. The point that you raised about his view of Chevron and textualism is key. Scalia hinged his, so much of his framework on the premise of there being, it'll work if, if judges are textualist at step one. And judges are a lot more textualist now than they were in 1989, but it's not clear that that aspect of the experiment worked. I mean, that's so much of the difference of opinion on applying Chevron is over how seriously we take the text at step one. Can I point out one other thing about this article? The most important thing about that article is that Scalia, throughout his defense of Chevron, situates it at a given moment in time. He says this framework makes more sense now than it would have made 30 years ago. Um, he says he makes a prediction on where history might go from there, but he never says that his view of Chevron is, is a once and for all first principles rule. He was trying to strike pragmatic balances based on the administrative state as he saw it at the time. And those, those last lines are key. He said Chevron speaks it more adequately, it, 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 you had, did you have the quote right there? The exact words he said, it, it more accurately reflects the reality of government and therefore more adequately serves its needs. And that's a non sequitur, by the way, but it's interesting that he was <laughs> focused on the needs of government and the reality of government at a time. And one of the problems with administrative law, and one of the reasons why we're going through such a dis dislocation right now, I think, doctrinally, is that we stopped paying attention to what the administrative state actually was and was doing, 
we're working under a law that's 75 years old, the APA, that adequately and accurately reflected the administrative state of 1946, but just does not reflect the reality of government today. And the most important thing judges can do when they're thinking about the doctrine is actually thinking seriously about the reality of governance today. And then Congress, I hope they reform the APA, and when they do it, I hope they do it in the spirit of the original APA. Study seriously the administrative state as it actually exists and does its work in the here and now, and then map new law onto it that makes sense for how agencies actually go about their work. Because right now, so much of what we talk about doctrinally is like a fantasy land. Professors referred to it, who was it? Ann O'Connell had the article, The Lost World of Administrative Law. Mm -hmm. I mean, it is like going through a museum. Um, and it, it shouldn't be like that. Uh, so I do have a, the, I hope this doesn't sound too sort of uh, inside baseball, but um, the, the justice who I think is uh, paying the most attention to uh, statutory interpretation, um, there are uh, new justices on the court and we, who knows what will happen, but that's uh, Chief Justice John Roberts. Uh, he's written, I'd say, the most substantive statutory interpretation cases, the, the cases that are assigned um, and uh, uh, most likely to be assigned in a leg reg class. Um, and um, I guess I think he's to some degree comfortable with the administrative state as it currently exists. So I wonder if, um, uh, you know, step one is the deregulatory step um, that um, uh, some people would like it to be. I just totally disagree with that last point, by the way. I mean, you read, you read his dissent in City Excellent. of Arlington, uh, he has his most his most over-the-top dissent, except for maybe Obergefell, yeah. where he says that the framers would scarcely believe their eyes if they saw how far administrative agencies reach into our lives now. But I think what's challenging about Roberts is he's very comfortable with federal power. Right. He's very squeamish about administrative power. And that's the difference between, say, NFIB and uh, his dissent, his joining uh, Gorsuch's dissent in the last non-delegation case, or his dissent in the Arling City of Arlington Chevron deference case. He's comfortable with national power. He's very wary of agencies, and I think he that's that's I think different from unfair justice. And I think it's it's interesting to watch him grapple with this. On that point, where do we see the law of preemption? because so much of this is tied to the scope of Congress's power, and you can see a natural tension between those who would allow for greater areas of federal oversight and those who might see a more robust role for state action. So might we see something in that direction as well? Mm. I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not sure. I, I, so when I, when I was in private practice, I was in a telecom and appellate litigation practice. Um, and so I often found myself uh, suing, suing the FCC, uh, which, you know, is fun. And then, uh, and then also uh, trying to get it, courts to accept expanded preemption uh, decisions based on FCC regulations, right? Suing private, private parties and state regulators and, and because there's a, there's a, a profound, I think, sort of centripetal force to, or gravitational force to federal law. And, um, but, but one thing we often thought about was, you know, what is this, what role do agencies play in determining the scope, the preemptive scope of federal regulations? And that's an area where I think we might see a, additional development in the wake of Kaiser, um, because it does go at, at base to this question of, of the interpretation of regulations. Um, and, Preemption is presented as a doctrine about congressional intent, but as a practical matter in the implementation of the statutes, the, the, the government institutions that are usually making determinations about the scope of federal preemption are actually administrative agencies. So one interesting question is how does this newly redefined, more narrow but powerful doctrine in Kaiser interact with uh, those those questions of, of preemption and the scope of agency authority through regulation to preempt state law. Okay. To, uh, I wonder whether preemption is such a good idea, and this is going to make me, um, uh, I guess, also a defender of federal power. Um, but so Dodd-Frank unpreempted um, state attorney general efforts to engage in sort of consumer financial protection. Um, and I, I think that's arguably um, 
made the law of um, uh, who is and what is entitled to um, uh, protection, uh, what counts as consumer protection by financial uh, institutions more uncertain. Uh, I think it's weird that the state of California may have its own net neutrality law, and I'm not clear to me that um, that makes sense uh, when you're talking about the internet which knows no border and all that sort of thing. I, I do think that there is a role for a, a pretty active waiver legislative process and in my view like sandboxes and uh, you know section 1115 um, Medicare and Medicaid waivers that allow states to experiment for the reasons that Adam said. I think that that seems like a more sort of controlled and predictable kind of uh, regulatory approach than, um, than uh, uh, either actively unpreempting um, so that the states can do stuff, or or, or judicially, um, you know, making clear that states can um, uh, do their thing in various areas. I used to be in the preemption business too. I was a energy lawyer for pipelines and energy infrastructure, <coughs> and I also think I was on the side of truth and justice there. I mean, I do think it is important <laughs> to not have patchworks of state regulation in 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 you know interstate actual interstate industries. Where this actually, where the rubber meets the road, I think, is, is through statutory interpretation. We saw this in the utility air regulatory group case. We see it in Clean Water Act cases. We see it where the courts go about their work of statutory construction with an eye to federalism questions and um, ask for a bit more emphatic language from Congress before they sort of assume that the agency is justified in encroaching upon traditional areas of state authority. And so I think that's how the preemption issue most commonly works itself, works its way out, uh, or will work itself out in a lot of these, these hot button issues. Well, we have some time remaining, and I'd like to turn it over to the audience at this point for your questions for the panel. So if there are any who would like to start the conversation, Raise your hand. This is mostly addressed to uh, Professor Zary. Um, you suggested that um, regardless of the standard review that's applied, um, judicial outcomes are so similar that we may as well remove the fake leap that you just apply a reasonable test uh, as the standard. So my concern is that this would both endorse and normalize results oriented in jurisprudence. Um, do you think that there's nothing to be gained from making the courts step through a more rigorous analysis and show their work in a way that kind of better demonstrates that they're not ruling through their gut? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. Um, so, uh, one of the reasons I've uh, come to this, um, you know, sort of, it sounds super realist, right? Uh, courts just sort of uh, check and see if the agency was reasonable, and uh, maybe they uh, are super likely to defer if they can barely even understand the scientific question that's being asked, and are uh, quite unlikely to defer if it looks like a really politically charged decision. That sounds like, you know, kind of an abandonment of law in general, doesn't it? Um, the reason I came to that decision was partly because, you know, when I, I teach administrative law and talk about the six different standards of review that apply to uh, agency determinations, determinations of facts, determinations of law, is it a formal adjudication, is it an informal adjudication, is it notice and comment rulemaking, is there really a difference between Chevron and Mead? I, I increasingly think it would be unrealistic to expect that um, even judges relatively well-versed in administrative law are able to make uh, firm distinctions. Um, and, you know, one of the reasons I thought I was onto something here is that the standard of reversal for agencies, regardless of the standard of review applied, doesn't seem to change that much. Agencies get reversed, and, you know, there's a huge selection bias. I don't want to suggest that this is um, rock-solid social science. Uh, agencies get reversed about two-thirds of the time, uh, and it's been that way for years and years. No. They get affirmed two-thirds of the time. And it's been that way for years and years and years across administration and administration. Um, so uh, I don't want to sound too nihilist, um, but I put all that together and I think that courts take a hard look at agency action and, uh, you know, with a presumption that uh, they're going to affirm unless there's something that suggests that they shouldn't. Um, uh, so um, that's sort of the reason why uh, I've come to the um, conclusion that I've come to. I will say that um, I was just reading a pretty interesting student note. Um, I think um, courts can be put on notice uh, by what happened at the agency 
that, um, that something might be up. Uh, so when an administrative law judge is overruled by the commission, um, uh, it seems that courts uh, look at those kinds of cases particularly closely. Uh, and of course, when there's a dissent, um, those kinds of cases seem to get uh, extra, extra attention by courts. And um, to me, that is reasonable and a reasonable form of deference. If you believe generally technocratic agency uh, decision making is something that Congress wanted you know, the, ag the agency experts to make the first call, and you get some sort of sense that that's not what's happening, then, um, and then I think that uh, courts should and courts do take a closer look. Um, but you're still, I'm still defending my idea that uh, it's a sort of closer look and uh, uh, not um, putting agencies through their paces and courts through their paces by running through the various canons of statutory interpretation and discerning whether they apply. You know, I think this is, uh, this flags one of the benefits of a, a well-designed and consistently applied regime of administrative procedure, which is that, it, I mean, and I'll put aside other benefits, but one thing it does is it, it sort of gives us a very clear format for what we can expect an administrative process to look like. And it creates the possibility of easily observable red flags, right? Places where there is a deviation from the from the normal course of things that might suggest that there's something going on in that process that deserves greater attention in judicial review. Um, and so one thing that we might think about if in fact Congress uh, decides to revise the APA is how can administrative procedures be designed to give clear red flags or smoke signals when something is wrong such that uh, courts can use a process-based approach to knowing when they need to take a closer look uh, at what an agency has done. Yeah. Now, phrasing it that way I think is the right way because we have to then define what is smoke and what's <coughs> a red flag. What do we want the agency to be doing, right? If an ALJ gets overturned by uh, the, the commission and that is a red flag, it means that there's something special about the ALJ's perspective that's lacking in the head of the agency's perspective and that we want to prioritize or give special emphasis to the ALJ's perspective. I see this also playing out not, not just with ALJs, but you see you know, more leaking and so on out of bureaucracy. Um, you see, I, I always stay away, I, I don't like the term the deep state. I think that's stupid in some ways offensive, but I do think there is some issues with the idea of, of a civil service or bureaucracy being at war with political leadership. If we start to, I think courts take notice of, of, of dissent from within the bureaucracy. When they do that, if that matters, and if that becomes one of the red flags, so then what that means is we're saying that it's the bureaucracy that probably has it right and not the head of the agency, right? The head of an agency disagreeing with an ALJ or disagreeing with bureaucracy means disagreements not just over technical values, but also over the value judgments that only the head of the agency can make, right, when making decisions that are factual decisions, but also policy-laden decisions. And what really worries me about, um, and this gets back to the thrust of my remarks, what really worries me about what, we, what judges respond to and what we want judges to respond to is that I don't think we're thinking or we're, we're debating nearly enough the value judgment side of agency work and making sure that when the head of an agency disagrees with somebody inside of the agency, it's not just because the head of the agency hates science or hates facts. I mean, that's, I'm sure that's a problem sometimes, but oftentimes it's just a basic difference in opinion over value judgments. And I would be very worried if administrative law preserved less and less space for that. Um, so, very interesting discussion. I feel like one thing that we haven't spent enough time talking about is uh, what makes administrative law interesting, which is the, uh, the, the fact that it's, it's part of the constitutional system of government um, and uh, what sort of drives the highest point of the, the court here in the first place. I think it's because it's part of the populist moment where people are feeling like they've lost control of the government. And an administrative law judge rules whatever an administrative law judge rules. And well, that's tough because the agency gets to do whatever the agency wants to do. Um, and I'd like to hear all of you sort of talk about this in that context. It's been a very pragmatic discussion, which is important to have. But uh, sort of how all this fits into 
people's feeling rightly or wrong, and that right that they need to take back control of their government. They want Congress to do its job. They voted for it. They want judges to do their job. They're supposed to decide what the law is, not an administrative law judge and set aside an executive agency. Um, and even if technocratically you get a worse result, well, maybe that's worth it because liberty matters. May I jump on this one? A couple of years ago, I wrote a little blog post. I said the most important book in administrative law today, it's not Philip Hamburger's book, with all due respect, and it's nothing that any other justice or judge is writing. The most important book for today's administrative law is a book from decades and decades ago called The Structure of Scientific Revolution, a study about the history of science and the nature of paradigm shifts and the way we think about science from one generation to the next. The basic point of that book is that a new paradigm arrives on the scene of social science, or science in general, not social science, science in general, and people spend more and more time making that framework ever more eloquent, ever more precise, filling in with ever more detail the little lattice work <coughs> of the framework. And that generation of scientists gets so focused on the elegance of their framework, they do not see the gigantic dump truck coming through the wall <laughs> saying, your framework answers a lot of questions, but it no longer answers the big questions. And when that shock comes from the outside, it causes a full rethinking of the framework itself. And I warned a couple of years ago, I think that's where administrative law has been for a long time. We spend so much time talking about does Chevron have two steps, three steps, zero steps, all the steps. Um, we don't sit back and say, is this actually answering the big questions? That's why I'm always drawn to those closing lines in Scalia's article, where he says it, it more accurately reflects the, more, the, 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 needs, the reality of government and thus more adequately serves its needs. Even Scalia was so focused on the reality of government and the needs of government that he was not asking the bigger questions about the needs of the people at large and the expectations of the people. And I think he, he like so many others, was setting himself up to be totally blindsided by uh, the, the, the views of administrative lawyers and judges and administrators becoming totally out of step with the needs of the people at large. And that's what we're dealing with right now. I guess I can weigh in. Uh so um, as my remarks have sort of suggested, um, uh, one of the things I think shouldn't be lost in the uh, you know, concern over uh, the accountability of the administrative state is that uh, we've got reasons to like many things that um, the administrative state has brought us. You know, our, our air is much cleaner, our water is much cleaner, um, our, our capital markets work. I study uh, financial institutions, and I uh, deeply worry about um, uh, how accountable um, financial regulators are, uh, and whether that's created a, a totally, you know, you scratch my back, I scratch your back sort of regulatory process that uh, reduces competition in the financial sector and uh, uh, empowers incumbents and, you know, basically um, creates a bunch of rich guys who are sort of quasi-public servants, um, uh, you know, uh, messing with the monetary supply. So. Uh, uh, I worry about that, um, but uh, you know I'm comfortable with the idea that um, some decisions should be uh, given to experts, um, uh, and I don't necessarily think that um, that uh, you know just because an administrative law judge said something that that's something that um, uh, should put a court on you know on you know we got to reverse the commission here. Um, but uh, I guess the most frustrating part of administrative law to me is the uh, are these guys supervisors questions that the National Labor Relations Board has um, been wrestling with for forever. So, uh, you know, um, uh, when there's a Republican majority on the NLRB, these guys are not supervisors. Uh, and then uh, when it comes up and uh, uh, in, when there's a Democratic majority on the NLRB, uh, they are, or, wait, they are supervisors, so they can't unionize. So they become not supervisors, so they can unionize. And I just, Something about that whole process of like, the, you know, these nurses can unionize, but these grad students can't, or whatever, these faculty members can't. Um, it just seems like purely political and uh, sort of silly in some ways, even though, you know, millions and if not billions of dollars turn on the are these guys supervisors question. And so, you know, when I think about what I most want out of my administrative state, I sort of don't want constant back and forth on. Uh, is it okay if these guys join a union or not, um, if that makes any sense. That's a steady administration, right? Yeah. yeah. I think we have time for one more here. Um, kind of broad question, I guess, but what type of behavior by administrative agencies 
do we not like under the current EPA or the current standards of review that we're trying to improve by perhaps improving the EPA by improving the standards of review going forward? So what, how do we want to see the behavior of agencies change that we maybe see a little bit of the answer? Is any part of it concerns over agencies having a, a desire to sort of subvert the process, you know, basically looking at the administrative process of notice and comment and things of that nature as being too time consuming, too cumbersome, and trying to just implement their false goals without sufficient respect for the process or other reasons? Well, you've done it. You've given me a reason to talk about adjudication. Um, and, and in a, one, so one area that I would like personally like to see reformed is is agency adjudication. In part because you know the APA crafts a structure for formal adjudication that is evidentiary hearings, where there should be, among other things, an administrative law judge who has independence from the agency um, through a whole structure um, that allows them to be more unbiased and more independent in their uh, in their decision making and and your comment uh, about the about Kaiser involves an adjudication that is not conducted under the APA's formal adjudication provisions the judge at issue there was not an administrative law judge who did not have these protections which to my mind and in the mind of the framers of the APA were fundamental to uh, due process so one thing I would like to see changed is for the APA to be enforced in adjudication um, and for those fundamental due process protections that the APA erects in formal adjudication to be actually given effect in the in those uh, programs. What worries me the most is closed-mindedness. Um, I think that so much of administrative law, a rule is proposed and it's based, more often than not, it's basically going to be the final rule and notice and comment doesn't mean a whole lot. I think the key to fixing this is more retrospective reviews of old agency rules. Look at the old rule, look at your analysis, your projections, see what you got right and wrong. Not because we necessarily want to get rid of the old rule, but I think if agencies were forced on a regular basis to go and look back at their old projections, figure out what they got right, what they got wrong, what they have a tendency to get right and get wrong, it would ideally make them more modest going forward. In a way, it's just taking a lot of the sort of lessons of behavioral economics that Cass Sunstein and others have done and applied them to the regulators themselves to illuminate the regulator's own intellectual blind spots. It's sort of an effort to nudge the nudgers. I think that's one of the most important things we could do. Uh, I'll throw a couple bombs that'll horrify you guys. Um, uh, <laughs> uh, and then say that uh, uh, um, one thing I, that uh, along those lines, an, uh, an adequate, um, okay, first the bombs. Um, I'm not that crazy about cost-benefit analysis. Uh, when I look at the cost-benefit analysis that agencies do, um, I think um, uh, it just doesn't look that great to me, uh, unless maybe for some environmental stuff that I can barely understand. Um, and um, if anything, I think that um, the requirement that you uh, have to be cost-benefit justified before you act is uh, nothing, is almost anti-democratic. Uh, I worry, uh, like I said, uh, notice and comment rulemaking is something that I think uh, reduces regulation. I'm worried that it's turned uh, our regulatory state into something that's quite corporatist. So um, there's a sort of, um, uh, through the notice and comment process, there's a sort of trade association, um, DC sort of agency uh, collaboration that happens around rulemaking, and I'm not positive that that's a good thing. Um, okay, so w what would be um, deregulatory and I think good? Um, uh, regulatory lookbacks is a good idea, but I, if we had a workable, and the problem with this is sunsets, they, they be, if sunsets happen, then they become, you know, then stuff expires and nothing replaces it, and I don't always think that's good. But if we had some sort of um, real regime of sunsetting regs um, and some requirement that um, uh, something be promulgated in the place, either deregulating or re-regulating or in changing the regulation. So, but some sort of active sunsetting of sort of every rule or every major rule, maybe. I, I think that could be. I think that could be a way to update agencies in a way that they've been had a hard time doing. Um, and so that's my deregulatory suggestion. It's a perfect place to end. I want to thank. I want to thank Emily, Adam, and David for this uh, wonderful exchange and. Hopefully it will not be another 30 years before we return to this important subject. Thank you to all for coming this morning and look forward to the rest of the conference.